Uh, I've just been on a train for about, feels like, a day. So I'm a bit sort of hazy because it got delayed for about an hour or so. Um, so but I'm extremely pleased to be here. It's really sunny and just to see and it's amazing. And I've been stuck in this office all week at global maximum temperatures for London, 38 degrees. So it's really nice to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. So just in case not clear, my name's Roger Hallam. I helped set up Extinction Rebellion. I was in the cafe, the famous cafe, last April with 15 weird people who decided to declare rebellion against the British government for criminal inactivity on the climate crisis. Extinction Rebellion doesn't really have like official spokespeople. I'm mainly talking, uh, or I am talking on my own behalf. What I'm gonna say is my interpretation of what Extinction Rebellion is doing, obviously, it's uh, agreed by a lot of other people, but at the end of the day, it's my view. So if you don't like it, that's cool. Uh, you can complain. <laughs> all right, that's all my disclaimer, because if you're not already aware, Extinction Rebellion says a few antisocial things. Just in case you don't know me, I've been at an organic farm. I grow organic vegetables in West Wales. Been doing that for 20 years. I've done five years of research on how to cause trouble effectively, as the joke goes, at King's College uh, on civil disobedience and what have you. And I've been involved in the strategic design um, uh, of the civil disobedience campaigns. And my life has changed sort of dramatically. Um, last year, uh, I was sort of weeding spinach in one of my polytunnels. And my partner came in and said that uh, Bernie Sanders just shared shared uh, the October Rebellion on his Facebook page with seven and a half million viewers. And I thought I shouldn't be reading spinach anymore, should be getting on with the rebellion. So I delegated my business and since then, I've been working 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week, sort of trying to organize our lost chance to save ourselves. I feel like I've gone from a sort of reasonably quiet, you know, you know what it's like, West Cornwall, West Wales, same sort of place, like no one's really bothered about you. It's just sort of <laughs> highlight of the week is going to the local town and buying some hummus and, uh, and the rest of the time just staring at the soil. Um, so I've gone from that to this sort of movie, this movie world that I'm in and every day I have to sort of pinch myself because these weird and wonderful things happen. So I'm gonna give you a little flavor of what it's like to be in Extinction Rebellion head office, as it were, I'm not supposed to call it that, but it is. And uh, so here it goes. So like last week, there was um, a rich guy from California phoned up and wanted to speak to me. So I was told he was very rich. Uh, so I was a little bit nervous and I was thinking I had to, to you know, be quite slick, as it were. So got on the online Zoom call with him and he wasn't slick at all. I'd say it was like in a bit of a panic and uh, um, yeah, it was very distressed. There was no two ways about it. And the reason is because his house had burnt down in California. Uh, he lives near Los Angeles in one of the many forest fires. Um, his house had gone, the house of his mates had been burnt down, all these rich, people lost their houses and he said to me uh, Roger uh, whatever it takes whatever it takes and yeah he's raising millions of pounds for climate change civil disobedience so that's a bit interesting wasn't expecting that and then like a week beforehand there was this guy who phoned up Extinction Rebellion phoned up the woman who works next to me and he said he's from COP. So I don't know if you heard about this COP thing, but it's where all these important people around the world that are supposed to sort out climate change get together every year and decide to do nothing about climate change. <laughs> if you're familiar with that? And uh, every year they sort of say they are, but they don't. And, and so I was expecting, you know, her to say that, 
you know, wanted someone from Extinction Rebellion to go and talk in this cop thing in Chile and, you know, so that, you know, the conventional climate change industry can see, you know, look a little bit more sexy or whatever, they like, sort of quite like Extinction Rebellion turning up to things. Anyway, turns out he doesn't want that. It turned out that, quote, he wants us to cause chaos at COP. <laughs> this is one of his top diplomats running the show, wants us to close down the event he's going to organise. <laughs> so, if anyone wants to fly to Chile, um, maybe you shouldn't, but anyway. OK, so that's another sign of the times. And then a few weeks ago, it was a month or two ago, actually, um, this BBC journalist phones, phones Extinction Rebellion up. And I don't know who it is, so don't ask, but apparently he's on telly every night and or every other night or whatever these people do. And he's, he's ringing up to give us advice on how to effectively blockade Parliament. <laughs> so, as a Chinese saying goes, we live in interesting times. And if you're, I'm sure there's a lot of us in this audience that have been faffing around for 30 years trying to create a semi-decent society and what have you, it's like nothing before, right? It's completely changed. And every, every, um, every week brings in these, these never happened before happenings. And I'd like to suggest to you, in case it's not obvious, that um, all around the world, and I mean literally all around the world, um, people are starting to have what can only be described as a nervous breakdown about the climate crisis or to put it more bluntly people are shitting themselves and this is an exponentially increasing situation I was just joking to someone when I came in that I did a talk in Shrewsbury I think it was about a year ago and I was like half an hour late because I thought I was going to be late to this meeting well there was only six people there right <laughs> so it didn't really matter but um, so here you are and there's however many of you. And I predict that maybe in a year or two's time there'll be like 10,000 people in Penzance because that's the way it's going. You can look upon that as a good thing or a bad thing. But um, So what I'm going to do, which might not sound a great idea, but I am actually going to tell you about the climate crisis. And I'm sure a lot of you are quite self-congratulatory that you're here because you've read it and you believe in it and we're all ready to go. Well, one of the things I've sort of realised over the last year is that you can know about climate change. You know, people say that all the time, don't they? they say, oh yeah, I know what's happening. But the fact of the matter is, you can know about it, but you don't really know about it, right? And when you really know about it, you haven't really felt it. And when you think you've felt it, you haven't really felt it, right? So it's a bit like grief, you know, it comes in waves, you know, you're shitting yourself one day and then for the next two weeks you sort of forget about it, the sun's shining, you know, there's plenty of food in Tesco's, it's like it has been for the last 30 years. And then, you know, read a Guardian article and you're going, what the fuck, you know? And then, you know, you forget about it again and then, you know, someone comes in and they're crying or something, it's bang, and, you know, it's like that, right? So I am going to tell you about the climate situation and the ecological crisis, not because you don't know, but just to put us in this space where we can hopefully connect with the enormous beyond belief sort of challenge that we've now got. Because otherwise, we're just going to be pretending like we've been pretending for the last 30 years, right? We've all been pretending, haven't we? I've been pretending, you know, 10 years ago, I knew, you know, the whole situation was fucked, but I was just there weeding my spinach, thinking someone else was going to get it on with it for me, you know? Uh, we've all been there, right? OK, so here's a way of looking at it. As I see it, like, one of the big sort of lies, the many lies about climate change, 
But one of the biggest lies is it's really complicated, right? And it's so complicated, you have to leave it up to these cop people and the scientists and the politicians and the experts because the poor common people can't work stuff out for themselves. And, you know, it's just, you know, this science thing, right? But the fact of the matter is, it's not that complicated, right? It's simply not that complicated. Some bits of it are complicated, but a lot of it isn't. You know, it's a little bit like going to the doctor and, you know, you've got something wrong with your foot and there's something complicated with your arm and every now and again you get these complicated headaches, but you've also got lung cancer, right? It's like, it doesn't matter that you can't work out what the headaches are about, you've got lung cancer. That's the killer fact, right? That's what's going to kill you. So it's the same with the climate crisis. You know, there's all these like fiddly bits, but there's some killer facts. So I'm going to go briefly through three killer facts. Okay, so the first one is the undeniable, clear, simple fact that the Arctic is melting, right? There's this stuff called ice, it's warm, it melts. Don't have to have a degree in science to work that one out, okay? So the fact of the matter is 75% of the volume of the ice in the Arctic Ocean has melted in the last 30 years, right? So not 2%, not 10%. If 10%, that would be a massive crisis. No, 75% has melted already. It's a catastrophe. There was like a Harvard professor two or three weeks ago, and he said that by 2022, in the summer, there'll be no permanent ice left in the Arctic. He said it was absolutely certain there'd be no permanent ice left in the Arctic, right? This is a Harvard professor, presumably knows what he's going on about, happens to be the guy that discovered the hole in the ozone layer in the 1990s. No ice is going to be left, no permanent ice. But you don't need to be a Harvard professor to work that one out. You can just be a teenage science student, you look at the graph, it's going down, it's going down, it's going to hit zero. Maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe in the next five years, it's going to be happening. And there's this simple, absolute scientific law that says once you remove the ice from dark water, you have this thing called the latent heat effect, which means that you dramatically increase the temperature. And as you may know, there's this thing called the Gulf Stream, which is being disrupted because the difference in temperature between the Arctic and the equator is becoming less. So it's slowing down, it's creating what's called weather blocks. We can talk about this a little bit more. But once that ice is gone, it's going to be completely chaotic. In the next 10 years, this is what's coming down the road. It's not complicated. So if you're a good scientist, I'm sure some scientists here, you know that if you look at a phenomenon, you should look at it at two or three directions, right? Just to be on the safe side. So let's look at it in terms of temperature. I'm sure we know, right? Since pre-industrial times, the average global temperature has increased around 1.1 degrees centigrade. Some people think it's a bit more, some people think it's a bit less, but it's in that ballpark. And there's this thing called the Paris Climate Agreement, right? Which I would suggest to you is the biggest example of a mass delusion in the history of humanity. Because it has this lie that we've got to stay below 2 degrees centigrade. The simple scientific fact of the matter is 2 degrees centigrade is already locked in. I spend a lot of my time in academia. It's well known in academia. It's bollocks. I'll give you simple, three simple reasons, right? There's this thing called the carbon lag. When you put carbon into the atmosphere, it doesn't immediately heat up the Earth. It takes 10 to 30 years for it to translate into higher temperatures. It's not complicated. It's coming down the tubes. So even if we stop putting carbon into the atmosphere tomorrow, 
you'd still have the last 10 to 20 years of carbon coming through. So a recent scientific peer-reviewed paper suggested that that's 0.7. So there's 0.7 of a degree still to come through, even if everything stopped tomorrow. So that's what? 1.1 plus 0.7, 1.8. Is that right? And then there's this thing called global dimming, 2005. Peer-reviewed paper. It's not complicated. The fossil fuels that the world's industries are putting up into the atmosphere, the pollution basically shades the sun's rays and stops the, the, the earth from heating. So once we've got rid of the fossil fuels, the pollution will go, the sun's rays will come through, and the estimate is it will increase global average temperatures by up to 0.7. So that's 1.9 plus 0.7, 2.6, right? And did anyone see that slightly inconvenient article that came out last week that's now established that the carbon that is in the soil will increase global temperatures by another degree by 2050? Because when you heat up the earth, you heat up the soil, and it releases more carbon. Well established, straightforward. That takes us over three. So even if those three things were a little bit wobbly, right? They were massively over two. That's before we factor in humans. And if you haven't noticed, carbon emissions are still going up. 1.62 years ago, 2.7 last year. So it's already locked in, two degrees centigrade. That's four degrees centigrade in the middle of continents. At four degrees centigrade in the middle of continents, you can't grow grains at scale reliably. That means one thing, starvation. So let's look at it a third way, just in case we're not totally persuaded. Pre-industrial times was 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's been going up exponentially for the last 100 years. One part per million going up, two parts per million. When I started telling people about the climate crisis, I felt a little bit embarrassed by saying that it's soon going to be three parts per million because it's going up exponentially. Several weeks ago, the data came in. Last year, it went up by 3.5 parts per million. Up to 415 parts per million. It wasn't so long ago when people were saying 350 was the limit, right? We're on 415. So let's do some maths. 10 times 3.5 is 35, plus 415. I make that 450. 450 is two degrees centigrade locked in within 10 years. And maybe it's going to be five to eight years because it's exponential, right? So we've been lied to. But that's not the real bad news, is it? The real bad news is we're facing social collapse. That's the other big lie. This is something to do with the Arctic, something to do with polar bears, something to do with the Amazon. No. What it's to do with is the collapse of this country. So David Attenborough had that cop thing. You remember what he said? The end of civilization. We're facing the end of civilization. But one thing I can tell you tonight is David Attenborough will not be doing a film on the BBC about the end of civilization. Because that wouldn't be too nice, would it? But there's plenty of academics that study the end of civilization. The modern word for it is social collapse. If you want to know what social collapse looks like, Check out Somalia. Check out Afghanistan. 
social collapse starts like this. Economic crisis that could come when the carbon price collapses, when the asset bubble of global coastal properties but bursts. It's coming, right? What does that mean? The academic word for it is the fiscal crisis of the state. That means the state runs out of money. Sounds quite academic, a bit abstract. What it means is you don't get your welfare payments. That's what the climate crisis means. There's no support for the poor. Then it means the schools won't be able to run. Then it means the university courses are going to close. Then it means when you take your parents to the hospital, there aren't going to be the beds. That's how social collapse starts. And then we've got the food, haven't we? What happens when we run out of food? I think like last year, there was no courgettes in the shops in February. Does anyone remember that? And everyone's having a little bit of a joke, right? I didn't think it was funny. Because I grow food and I know what it means. I know what it means when there's snowstorms in southern Spain. It means something's coming down the line. And what came down the line happened last year. For the first time, there were food growing crises across the Northern Hemisphere. 20% down in North America, Europe and Russia, all in one year. And as a sustainability professor, 30 years in the trade, he said, if that happens three years running, there'll be mass starvation in Europe. In three years. He's written a paper about it. It's been downloaded 450,000 times. The most downloaded academic paper in history. Why? Because people have been fed up about being lied to. Everyone start to wake up and want to know what's actually going on. About 15 years ago, I planted out all my crops, 20 acres of crops. Started raining on the 2nd of June. It rained every day for seven weeks. I lost every single outdoor vegetable. I lost £100,000, 20 people lost their jobs, I was out of my head with stress, but no one cares, right? Who cares? Because if you can't get your food from West Wales, you can fly it in. And then the following year, it rained almost for seven weeks again. And then we had the warmest April, then we had the dullest August, then we had the coldest winter on record, minus 15 for a fortnight. I lost 30,000 leaks, every single leak. And then last year, it was the warmest summer on record in Wales. But it didn't matter. Do you know why it didn't matter? Because I don't grow food anymore. I don't grow food outside. Because I can't afford it. I can't afford the risk. There used to be 20 horticulturalists in West Wales, now there's four. I spoke to one of my mates, he said, I'm packing up, it'd be better for me to go to Swansea Casino and put my 40 grand down. Because he doesn't know what's going to happen. And there's literally hundreds of millions of farmers around the world shitting themselves every year now because they don't know what's going to happen. And if you grow food for a living, the worst thing is not knowing what's going to happen because you don't know what to do. 
It's a casino, right? So we knew this like 10, 15 years ago. So that's the food. But the real end point here is war. Because what do you think is going to happen when hundreds of millions of refugees are fleeing from the tropics? There's going to be war. And we haven't had war here since the 1940s. Not a big war, but it's coming back. So my suggestion to you is, when you're talking to the good people of Penzance and West Cornwall, don't talk about the polar bears, right? Talk about social collapse. Talk about the welfare payments. Talk about the food in Tesco's. Not being there. And talk about their kids being sent off to be slaughtered. Because that's what the climate crisis means. Long before London and the global cities are flooded with water, which is now locked in. So the last thing I want to say about this, and this is the crucial thing, is this is absolutely real, right? It's every week, isn't it? When I started doing these talks, I was going, it was 46 degrees in France, and everyone nods their head, 46 degrees. But last week it was 42 degrees in Germany, right? A world record. This Thursday, it was 38 degrees in London. The hottest London day on record. What's going on? What's going on is it's absolutely real. It was 53 degrees in Karachi last year. Several hundred people died from heat stroke. No one really cares because it's Karachi, right? No one knows. But we have this idea that when it gets to like 55, there might be a few hundred more people like dying from heat stroke, right? 57, a few more. No, that's not correct. There's this thing called nonlinear dynamics in social and economic system, systems. What that means is there'll be a few hundred people dying from heat stroke and then it goes up a little bit more and there'll be a thousand or two, goes up a little bit more and three million people will die in a few days. Because there's this thing called the wet bulb effect. You should look it up if you don't know about it. At a certain point, the human body cannot survive heat and humidity and it dies in six hours. It's non-linear, right? It's like hypothermia, isn't it? You get cold, you get cold, and then you die, and then you're not coming back. This is already happening in the animal kingdom. Two, three years ago on the Russian steppe, 200,000 deer died in three days. They had this bacteria in the nose, got above a temperature they've never known before, bacteria moved to their brains and it destroyed them. This is non-linearity. This is the fundamental reason why there aren't 10,000 people in this room tonight. Okay? It's because we think it's going to be 38, 39, 40, you know, and it's just going to carry on. But at a certain point, it's bang, mass death. Social collapse. In the last few weeks, I've talked to some of the leading political economists around the world. They all know what's coming, and they're all of one mind about the matter. When it comes, it's going to be fast. A few days, a few weeks. 
because everything's connected. So yeah, we all know about the climate crisis, right? And we can feel it as well. So I'm not like, I'm not going to spend the rest of the talk talking about that because I'm going to talk to you, dare I say it, about something more difficult. And the more difficult thing is knowing there's something we can do about it. That's the difficult thing. And what I'm going to talk to you about is the thing that tells you there's something you can do about it, and that's the social science. Because one of the nice things about knowing about the natural science, the climate science, is you can be really clear that it's true, right? And as I said, it's quite nice to be uh, sort of self-congratulatory about it. You can talk to everyone and say, you know, that nasty Mr. Trump, those nasty Republicans, they don't understand the science. Aren't we better than them? But the real challenge is, are you ready to accept the social science? Because the social science has killer facts as well. When Martin Luther King organised the civil rights movement in the 1960s, there was a bit of a joke that he only had two books to go on. The Autobiography of Gandhi and the Bible. But over the last three decades, there's been 30 years of research in how to effectively change a society in a radical way. Systematic social science. And one of the leading world scholars, Erika Chenyuev, came to London a few months ago to talk about how this has been done dozens and dozens of times with clear causal factors. And she said to us, we no longer have any excuses. We don't have to make this stuff up. We don't need to read the Old Testament. They might help. So, for what it's worth, I'm an award-winning researcher at King's College. But what I'm going to tell you over the next half hour is 101 social science, OK? It's the killer fact stuff. Again, there's loads of complicated bits and pieces. You know, there's long tails and there's outliers and all the rest of the palaver, right? but there's some fundamental things. And the fundamental thing that has come out of the social science is if you want to rapidly change the political direction of a society in the shortest amount of time, there's one way to do it, and that way is mass participation, civil disobedience. Period. Now, we all know, don't we, that we've been trying very, very hard to sort out the climate crisis for 30, 40 years. I'm sure there's people in this audience who've been at it, doing all that great stuff. I've been doing it, I've done the permaculture, I've done the courses, I've gone on the retreats, I've done the emailing, I've gone on the marches, I've lobbied my MP, three pounds to Friends of the Earth, fantastic stuff, and it's got us nowhere. Since 1990, there's been a 60% increase in carbon emissions, from the point at which the scientists told us all what I've just told you. It was already settled in 1990, right? So for 30 years we've been doing all this great stuff and everyone's been fantastic. And I don't mean to be at all disrespectful, but the fact of the matter is it's been a catastrophic failure. Half the carbon emissions that have ever been put into the atmosphere by the human race 
have happened since Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth came out. Think about that. Catastrophic failure. So that's the starting point of thinking about what really works. And what really works is what we haven't been doing. And what we haven't been doing is causing a fuss, okay? Now, just to let you know, I don't like causing a fuss, all right? I had a very overbearing mother, and the last thing I like to do is upset people, just for the record, all right? So don't think I'm some sort of mad, radical, you know, hate everyone and want to cause, you know, blah, 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 right? I'm just telling you the facts here, all right? And I find this stuff as difficult as you. When I first went on my first roadblock, my legs were shaking. So it's not about me, it's not about my personality, it's not about some ideology, it's about the facts. Civil disobedience works, and the reason it works is because of two things. The first thing is disruption. No one takes any notice of you unless you cause disruption. When the workers go to an employer and say, we want to have a wage increase, everyone knows what happens, don't we? No. When the workers combine together and stop working and go on strike, causing disruption to that company, everyone knows what could happen and often does happen. The accountant comes in, tells the boss they're losing too much money, the boss calls in the union and the union does a deal and gets that wage increase, right? It's been going on since 1880. Doesn't always work, but what we do know is being nice doesn't work. It's just the way it is. Disruption increases the costs, the economic costs, the reputational costs of the opponent. Disruption creates attention, and attention is the first point at which people start to change their opinions. You get the eyeballs, right? In 2003, a million people, I'm sure many of us know, went down to London to protest about the Iraq war. Everyone waved the banners, everyone thought it was great, everyone got on the bus, came home. What happened? Nothing. Because a march never causes disruption. It's there and it's gone. Great idea, but it doesn't work. The other reason why civil disobedience works is because of sacrifice. You won't be getting emails from Friends of the Earth about sacrifice, right? No one likes to talk about it. The fact of the matter is, the only reason we're sitting here today in this relatively free society is because of millions of people sacrificing their liberty and ultimately their lives for our common good. That's the legacy they left us. The fact of the matter is, without suffering, there's no change. It's a hard truth, but it's a fact. And the reason for that is because when you put yourself into a position where you're going to get arrested, or go to prison, or lose some of your material privileges, people take you seriously. 
because you're walking your talk, because an action is worth a thousand words, because information never changes entrenched power. What changes people is seeing people suffer for their beliefs. So I'd love tonight to give you, you know, a nice happy clappy summary of Extinction Rebellion and how wonderful we've been and how great it is there's 150 of us in this room, right? But it's an emergency, isn't it? I've got like half an hour left and I'm going to spend that half an hour taking that emergency seriously and telling you how this works why it works and why, if we want to maximise the possibilities, our children are not going to have a horrendous death, this is what we need to do. And what I'm going to suggest to you is this involves arrest and it also involves going to prison. And I've done about 10 of these talks, and I hate this bit of the talk, because everyone's like looking like, you know, it's a nice, pleasant talk, and suddenly I like, come out with this taboo. But Extinction Rebellion, the slogan is, tell the truth and act as if it's real. Don't tell the truth as long as people like you. Don't act as if it's real as long as you don't upset people, right? When we were in that cafe, we decided to call ourselves Extinction Rebellion. Everyone thought we were mad. You can't mention extinction. You can't mention rebellion. But we did it anyway. And we've got 100,000 people on the mailing list in a year. Why? Because people want to hear the truth. So there's a plan, as some of you may know, to fly toy drones at Heathrow. It's going to be an independent action because it's controversial. But the fact of the matter is, it's going to be 100% safe. It's also going to be 100% illegal. And it's a good bet that if people do that, they'll end up in prison. There may be some other scenarios. I'm not going to talk about specifics tonight. The fact of the matter is, if you break the laws that enable the carbon corporate state to not function, they are going to put you in prison. And I'm going to show you why that's their Achilles heel. So I'm not going to give you like loads of like, you know, technical academic stuff. I'm going to tell you three stories that highlight how this works. So in 1931, the Salt March. Probably the most famous act of mass civil disobedience in the 20th century. Gandhi set off in India with 78 volunteers, okay? That's about half of the people in this room. That's not a hint. <laughs> Sacrificial, era busting civil disobedience always starts off with very few people. That's rule number one. Number two is, everyone thinks you're an idiot. Congress thought it was a stupid idea. The political activists thought it was a stupid idea. But Gandhi did it anyway. He set off with his 78 people, lots more people, joined him on the march. He got to the coast, said to the British authorities, I want to make salt reasonable demand, you would have thought. No, no, no. You can't make salt at that time in India unless you pay a tax. The British said, no, you're not going to. Gandhi said, yes, we are. Confrontation. 
To cut a long story short, the British military police lined up in a line. Gandhi's followers walked towards the military police to get to the sand and the coast. They were calm, they were civil, they were plainly dressed, totally non-violent. They walked up to the military police. The military police got out their trunches and split open their heads. There was blood everywhere. The photographs went round the world. The film footage went round the world. There was a massive international scandal. And that was the moment when the veneer of British superiority in India cracked and vanished forever. The historians will tell you that was the moment, that was the tipping point when the British lost control. It took another 10, 15 years to get independence, but after that, the Indians had had enough because they saw what the reality of the British occupation was. In other words, the implicit violence was made explicit for the whole world to see. 60,000 Indians went to prison in the following months. India's a big place. So let's look at the civil rights movement in the States. Another example of what people do when they get serious about what they believe in. The Freedom Riders campaign. 25 students started this off. It's about a quarter of the people in this room. 25 students, not many, rule number one. They suggested they were going to do something innocent. Notice it's not a big deal, right? Making salt, it's not a big deal. Riding on a bus, a black and white person sitting together. It's not a big deal, right? But it happens to be totally illegal. So they were going to go down from Washington DC into the Deep South. The civil rights movement on the phone saying, don't do it, it's stupid, it's reckless, it'll split the movement. Sound familiar? Martin Luther King was on the phone, don't do it. They did it anyway. They set off down to Atlanta. They were surrounded by the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan set fire to the coach. They dragged the students out and they beat them up. What happened next? Another 25 students got on the bus and came down south. They were holed up in a coach station surrounded by a mob. It was touch or go whether they were going to die or not. It was on all the front pages of national press. That's what happens when you draw the violence out for all to see. The president notices. There was President Kennedy at his breakfast table with it all over the front page sends down his special representative to sort it out. The racists beat him up. Not a good move. Hundreds more people start coming down on the coaches. They get to Mississippi. When they get to Mississippi, they put them in prison. They put them in prison. Hard labour. At the end of the summer, there's 500 people from all walks of life doing hard labour in Mississippi. The federal government cracks. That autumn, they bring in major legislation to desegregate. For the first time in 70 years, 70 years of conventional campaigning, does that sound familiar? Three months of civil disobedience, a structural change. Disruption, Sacrifice. Let's look at the Children's March, 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. Martin Luther King can't get people to go to prison. This DJ comes up to him and says, I'll get people into prison for you. 
What he doesn't tell Martin Luther King is it's the kids. If you know some Fridays for a future people, maybe some of you are here, then watch the Children's March on YouTube. It's a little bit different. It has a radio station, they have this thing called D-Day, all the kids are going to come out. D-Day happens, all the kids come into the back of the Central Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The DJ guys get them to come out, they come out, singing, marching, the police are there, the police have requisitioned coaches, 50 kids at a time go into the coach, off to prison. All they were doing is a little innocent thing, right? Walking along the road in Birmingham, Alabama. No, that's totally illegal. The next 50 kids come out. They're into the coaches. They're into prison. The next 50 kids out. After the first day, there's a thousand young people in prison. A thousand. What happens on the second day? Thousands more kids come down to Birmingham. 3,000 kids in prison at the end of the second day. It keeps going day after day for seven or eight days. What happens after seven or eight days? The authorities give in. The chief of police goes on telly and he says, the fear has gone. The kids are in prison singing songs, having a party. The fear has gone. When the fear goes, radical political change happens. We're all here in this room, aren't we? With that fear in us, right? Radical political change goes when you don't fear. So I'm sure you're thinking, as we all like to think, this is something you see on YouTube, something you see on Netflix, on telly, it's these amazing things, it's the movie that we haven't been in all our life, right? It's something that happened somewhere else, it happened in the 20th century, we don't need to worry about that anymore. So in case you think this is just some sort of weird thing that doesn't happen anymore, I'm going to give you two more examples. I've been at King's College, I'm quite famous at King's College for being the only student that's been suspended twice. All the security guards know who I am. Two years ago, I went up to the fossil fuel group, the fossil fuel divestment group, right? Thousands of these groups around the world trying to get divestment, we're all familiar with this. I said to them, how are you getting on, guys? They said, well, We've been doing this for four years. We've done the petition. We've joined the committees. We've got a meeting with the vice principal. We had the rally. Sound familiar? I said, what have you achieved? Well, they said, we've got something on tar sands. So I checked it out. King's College had done a 10-year corporate plan to make the world a better place. That's very original. Turns out that they're going to divest from tar sands by 2029 if it makes economic sense. <laughs> you familiar with that one? Turns out that tar sands are 2% of King's College fossil fuel investments. Not that great. So I said to them, OK, so why don't you do a bit of direct action? They said, oh no, we don't want to do that because we're going to upset people. We're on the committees, we've got the relationship with the vice principal, we're trying to make progress. Have you heard this one? When you go to Penzance County Council, whatever it is, we don't want to upset people, we need to talk about this. The most ineffectual way to bring about change is not to upset people. Just the way it is. 
So I said, right, I'm going to do a little shaboodle. You know, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Started off with me and one other student. That's me and one of you. That's not a lot. We had this bright idea of putting spray chalk around the walls of King's College. We weren't quite sure what we were doing. There was like dots. It was supposed to be connect the dots. It was a bit stupid. Never think that when you do a direct action campaign, you need to know what you're doing. You don't. You just need to do it. You'll work it out as it goes along. So we're caught, we're going to be disciplined. In January, I spray chalked the front of King's College. Eight students came to me and said, this is cool, we want to do some of this. I said, that's great, we're going to spray chalk the Gothic Central Hall of King's College. All that colonial stuff. So I had this military operation, two of us from four directions, with our spray chalk, all shitting ourselves. Went into the central hall, this big gothic hall. Five minutes later, we completely plastered it all with spray chalk. We had all these slogans. The slogans didn't make any sense because everyone was too nervous to get the words in the right order. <laughs> it was a total mess. <laughs> the vice principal was down in five minutes. Five minutes it took him. He came up to me and said, Roger, this sort of thing shuts down the conversation. I said to him, it's the first time I've had a conversation with you. <laughs> That's what you call a dynamite response, right? <laughs> Remember that one when you do something to the leader of the local council. The following day, I was suspended from King's College. I was banned from entering King's College property. What did I do? I entered King's College property. They dragged me out. I didn't blink. After 10 days, they blinked. They let me back in. They had a little word with their public relations department, decided suspending a student for civil disobedience on climate change wasn't going to do much for their image, right? I worked that one out. I sat down with him and I said, I'm going to go on hunger strike. I want you to totally divest from fossil fuels. He went to see the investment committee. They had an emergency investment committee meeting. When you go to the council and they say, sorry, we're not meeting until September. That's not a law of physics. It's a social convention. When the shit hits the fan, when there's an emergency, people meet, right? They make a phone call. They had two emergency investment meetings. The vice principal went to them, said, they've got this mad guy, it's on hunger strike, get a move on. After 14 days, phew, <laughs> they decided to sign a piece of paper in front of the press committing to entirely divest from fossil fuels by 2022. Everyone shook hands, everyone's friends. Five week campaign, five weeks compared with four years. What was the causal factor? The willingness to sacrifice. So let's have a look at April. Extinction Rebellion, don't know if you're involved in November. You know, we were going to block roads in London. Loads of people were phoning me up saying, Roger, this is really antisocial. Roger, you know, you're going to put the public off. You're going to piss off the police. You might even get arrested, for God's sake. But we did it anyway. Because Extinction Rebellion is based on the social science. That enables us to make predictions. This April, there was 1,200 arrests in London in eight days. 
It was the biggest civil disobedience event in British history. 1,500 arrests with the suffragettes over 10 years, if you want to know. That was by design, right? That's sitting in London in five-hour meetings, trying to work out how we we're going to do this. We worked out if we just occupied one site in London, the police would let us do it, because they hate arresting people, right? Cost them money. But if we had four or five sites, you'd get over that criticality point when they'd have to arrest people. And it happened. And what happened, right? Beforehand, hardly anyone in the UK had even heard of the climate emergency. Afterwards, 67% of the British population agrees there's a climate emergency. The Labour Party, bless them, 400 Prime Minister question times, not one single mention of climate change. They suddenly discover the climate emergency. Emergency debate, Parliament says there's a climate emergency. What's the causal factor? 30 years of sending petitions? No. Eight days of arrests. It's just the way it is. In the three weeks after those arrests, Extinction Rebellion signs up 50,000 people. Half a million pounds of donations come in. Billionaires start phoning up. It hasn't stopped. What's the causal factor? Not a one-day march in London, right? If we want to sort this situation out, we know what to do. Disruption and sacrifice. So why do people do it? The fact of the matter is, people choose to get arrested and go to prison and all the rest of it for a whole wide range of reasons. So I want to go through three of those, just to give you a little example of what's going through people's minds around the country at the moment. And what's been going through those minds of people in those civil disobedience struggles that I've just talked to you about? What is it that makes people put themselves in harm's way? The first reason is very simple. People are simply terrified. It's as simple as that. You just heard the catastrophic horror of what's coming down the road. And the penny drops. And the penny drops when people realise they're going to get hurt anyway. They're going to lose their careers anyway. Their children are going to suffer anyway. So it's not like, hey, put yourself in harm's way, get arrested, go to prison and what have you, or carry on as normal with your career, with your nice family life, with your small holding, thinking it's all going to carry on. No, it's not going to carry on. It's going to go anyway. So you might as well put yourself in harm's way. One of the girls on the children's march, she gets interviewed, and this interviewer says to her, why are you going out and getting arrested? Why are you going to prison? Why are you putting yourself in harm's way? And she just looks at the camera and she says, we're going to get hurt anyway. We're going to get hurt anyway. So it's no big deal. It's coming down the road anyway. So the second reason, the second reason people all around the country are going to be putting themselves in harm's way in the rebellion this October, possibly at Heathrow, or other actions, 
is simply this. It's an act of conscience. It's a realisation that I cannot not step forward. This is who I am. I can't be myself and not act. I can't be myself and pretend I don't know what needs to be done. Because I do know what needs to be done. It's a sense of civic duty. Civic duty is something that we've been told we should forget, right? Ever since Margaret Thatcher, there's just me, there's my career, there's my family, there's the money, there's the mortgage, there's the quiet life, work hard, everything will be fine, right? That's what we've been told. But there's another story that we belong to a society, that we're citizens and we have obligations as well as rights. And if we want to live in a society that's semi-decent, sometimes you have to step up. I'm 53, I got involved in activism when I was 14 in the peace movement in the 1980s. I used to go to the Quaker meeting house in Stockport and people used to turn up, these guys used to turn up, they used to be 70, 75 years old, they used to have these nice little ties, immaculate jackets, perfect hair, you know these guys all look like Methodist ministers, right? They were conscientious objectors from World War II and I remember Sam saying to me, Roger, I will not kill. I will not kill. If I have to die, so be it, but I will not kill. And they had that like luck in their eyes, you know? And whatever you think about conscientious objection, that's not the issue. The issue is some people know what they're about. They know where that red line is. And they will not go over that red line, come what may. The third reason is a sense of adventure. I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking, oh, that Roger Hallam is so moral and all the rest of it, must be a great guy. No, just for the record, I'm not. You could ask my ex-partners. <laughs> okay, I'm just an average organic farm that's shitting himself. Okay? The fact of the matter is, a lot of people that are stepping up to go to prison this autumn, to get arrested this autumn, are as screwed up as the rest of you. Okay? You don't need to go on five personal growth courses to get yourself arrested. All you need is a little bit of a sense that life is short and this is going to be a bit different. And historically, a lot of people that step up do it because it's an adventure. You're in that boring job, you only got another 30 years on this planet, what the fuck, let's go down to London, right? I'm sure you've seen that film, Schindler's List, right? You know the Hollywood version? You know, a great guy, saintly, you know, saves loads of Jews. No. Schindler was a thief. Before the Second World War, he was a thief. During the Second World War, had a bit of a sense of adventure, saved thousands of Jews. After the war, went back to being a thief. The fact of the matter is, People that step up to do something like this are often more screwed up than the rest of us. That's why they step up. The old fashioned word for this is redemption. You've messed up your life, you haven't done anything that great. At least you can do something decent for a change. 
So don't think you have to be a hero. Don't think you have to be a saint. Because you're not. You're just normal people seeing something beyond bad coming down the road. Okay. So I'll come on to the controversial part of the talk now. <laughs> this bit always gets me in trouble. Let's just look at this little taboo, right? Going to prison. My proposition to you is in the wider scheme of things, going to prison is no big deal. No big deal. I have a friend who's a researcher. He researches trade unionists in Egypt. Goes down to Egypt, he's sitting in a room in Alexandria with 15 trade unionists round in a circle. They've all got scars on their head. Because in Egypt, if you go to prison, you get tortured. So the good news is, you're not going to get tortured in a British prison. Never say never, of course. <laughs> so let's just keep that in mind, right? So just let's concretise what we're talking about here. Because one of the things about fear is, oh my God, I can't get arrested. Oh my God, I can't go to prison. It's because you haven't really actually thought about it. When you actually think about what it concretely means, like any other fear in our life, you go through it, and yeah, it's terrifying, but at least you know what it is, and it's no, you start like realising you can do it, right? And it took me five years to decide to do an MA at Swansea University. Procrastinating. One day I just wrote down what it meant. You know, look on the internet, fill in the form, go to the interview, go in. Really not a big deal. So let's do it with the arrest thing. I'm sure some of you have been arrested, so you know the routine, right? You're sitting in the road, a police person comes up to you, says you shouldn't be sitting in the road, you say you know, he says he's going to arrest you, you say that's fine, he picks you up, four police people, puts you in the van, takes you to the police station, you walk in, you go to a desk, and you know what happens? You have to fill in a form. Sounds familiar? Then you go into a room, you have a nap, let you out because you haven't got enough cells for everyone else that's coming through. You go back down to the bridge, you sit in the road, police person comes up to you, says you shouldn't be doing this. You say you know, says he's going to arrest you, fair enough, lifts you up, puts you in the van, takes you to the police station, fill in the form, lets you out straight away because even more people have been arrested. One of the few plus sides of austerity is <laughs> you get let out after two hours. A silver lining if ever there was one. The Metropolitan Police arrest 300 people, then they have to start driving people down to Brighton. So let's do the prison thing, okay? You're sitting in the road, sounds familiar. Maybe you're flying a drone at Heathrow, you've got your Argos drone, 100 pounds, toy drone, you're flying it, you've got your picnic ready. A police person comes up to you and says, you can't fly a drone because you're within five kilometres of Heathrow. You say, you know. He says, he's going to arrest you. You say, fair enough. And you get carried into the van. You go to the police station, you go into a cell, you go to a magistrate, says, don't do it again. You come out. Someone gives you another toy drone from Argos. You go for a picnic, you fly a drone. The police person comes up, says, don't do that. You're going to get arrested. You say, fair enough. It goes overnight. You go to the magistrate. The magistrate says, you've done it twice. You can't disturb the sacred, sacredness of the fossil fuel death machine. And he puts you in prison on remand. So what does that mean? You go to a big building, you go in, you go up to a desk, you know what happens? Fill in a form. Well, it's more exciting because you have to fill in three forms. 
and then you put in a room, you change your clothes, they take you to your room, take you to a room, they close the door, there's a telly, there's a bed, there's a loo, they bring your food for you three times a day. You know what it sounds like? A second-rate retreat centre. <laughs> I've been to prison several times. I'm sitting there in my cell, I've got my books, I read my book and have a nap, read my book a bit more, have another nap, three naps a day, paradise, right? I'm an organic grower, I'm used to working 14 hours a day and having to look after the kids. It's a holiday. You go out to this playground area, you're with your mates, you can swap your books, it's a bit like one of those East European spy films, you sort of slipping books into each other's pockets, read this, really good. It's a book club. <laughs> and all your mates have brought in all those existentialist classics from the mid-19th century, you know, which everyone thinks are worthy but are really boring. And after a week you get out, and you spend a week for the first time in your life doing nothing apart from thinking about how you can be a better person and having a nice rest, you come out super enlightened, super calm, and you get surrounded by all these people that are super stressed out because they're trying to support you in being in prison. You have to calm them all down. <laughs> That's going to prison. So it's no big deal, right? Except it could be. For all those people that are just going to stand up afterwards and say, yes, obviously, something terrible could happen. You could be traumatised. You could get beaten up. Terrible things could happen. It's quite likely you're going to be talking to someone who's had a really shitty life. And that can be scary and challenging. But that's what sacrifice is, right? It's not a free lunch. All I'm saying is, it's not quite as bad as the people that want to take your children to their deaths want to make it out to be. This machine that we have to dismantle wants you to be afraid. Because that's the primary reason why they're going to be able to take us to our deaths. Elites have been doing this all through history. To get into power, and they hold on to power, and they have you go to your deaths in order for you to stay in power. Apologies again, if you think you're going to come to a nice Friends of the Earth-esque chat about climate. Extinction Rebellion is not about being popular. Extinction Rebellion is about doing what is necessary to get the job done. That's why I've gone down to London, to get a job done. And when I talked to Robin, my mate in Bristol that set up Extinction Rebellion with, he said, Roger, we're going to do this Time Is Now tour. You know, you can go to festivals, and you can go here and you can go there. I said, I don't want to go to festivals. I don't want to talk to people that are pissed and on drugs who want to be entertained and feel good about being a little bit green. We've done that for 30 years. What I want to do is go and talk to real communities in real places, to real people who know what it's like to be ignored, to work hard, and for shitty things to happen to them. Because those are the people who are like me. <coughs> and I have something to tell you guys, right? In case you're not totally aware of this already. Is all the people that are going to sort out the climate crisis for you are not. They haven't done it for 30 years and they're not going to do it in the next 30 years. Since I went down to London and became semi-famous, I just get phoned up and go and see all these posh guys, right? I went to see the chief executive of Greenpeace a year or so ago, 
and said to him, we've got to do mass participation, civil disobedience. He said, no, it's abstract. People won't mobilise. He was wrong. He's the expert, but he's wrong. Slightly changed the tune since then, by the way. I went to the uh, editor of The Guardian. That sounds good, doesn't it? I did that like 20 minute spiel, you know, the one that has that abject fear that I can see in your eyes when I tell you. Do you know what she said after 20 minutes? She said, thanks very much, Roger. It's like I'd just given a quarterly finance report. Do you know what they've done? Eight weeks later, we get 40 minutes to talk about campaign reporting techniques at The Guardian. I didn't talk about reporting techniques. I talked about the editors going on hunger strike. But they're not going to do it, right? <coughs> and the reason all these posh people aren't going to do it is simple. It's because they've got too much skin in the game. They don't understand that you have to sacrifice. The editor of The Guardian isn't going to go to prison. Sure, they're going to do all those articles that tell you that you're going to die, but they're not going to do anything about it. The only people that are going to do something about this are you. And that's not because I'm trying to be nice to you or be buddy or whatever. It's a social scientific phenomenon. That the people that engage in civil disobedience historically are usually ordinary people. It's not going to be the rest of those people in Penzance that aren't here tonight. It's not going to be the North London liberal elite. It's going to be you guys. It's going to be the guys in Carmarthen. It's going to be the guys in Scunthorpe. It's going to be the guys in Sunderland. It's going to be the ordinary British people. Because that's the only way anything ever did change. That's our heritage. The Chartists, the suffragettes, the trade unionists, the civil rights activists, they're ordinary people. So what I've told you tonight basically means it's not like you don't know anymore. Okay? That's my message to you. Obviously, I have to say that everyone has to make their own decision and everyone always has to make their own decision. But it's not like you don't know. And there's that great quote from Mandela about fear. And the quote is something like this. The greatest fear we have is not the fear of the powerful, it's the fear of our own power. It's the fear that you could actually make a difference. So as I say, hundreds of people around this country are committing to going to prison, are committing to get arrested this autumn. Thousands of people will be coming on the streets because they no longer got any excuses. And my prediction is that major change is going to be happening because the pennies dropped. The fear has gone. And I was in a workshop two weeks ago and there's this guy there, he's 20 years old, 
working class lad from Leeds, come down to London, got a job, didn't know anything about climate change. One day, this guy says to him, you do realise it's all falling apart, don't you? He said, you, what? Found about climate change, packed in his job, started working full time for Extinction Rebellion. Now he leads Extinction Rebellion drummers. It's a bit of a guy. And we do this talk about the drones and Heathrow and what have you. And he does the most impressive testimonial I've heard in my life. Because he's just talking for himself as a normal guy, right? And he comes up to me afterwards and he says, Roger, I can't wait till September. I can't wait. And his eyes are bulging with excitement. So my message to you guys is, you've got it. We can't wait. So thanks very much. <laughs>